Well, greetings, church family. Today's daily Bible reading had us in Jeremiah chapter 30. And this entire chapter is a promise of deliverance and restoration right after proclaiming to the exiles their need to settle down in Babylon and serve it well while they were captive there. Right after he rebuked the false prophets for opposing his messages and falsely declaring that the Lord would swiftly break the yoke of Babylon and free his people. The Lord now makes clear through Jeremiah that there would come a day when he would free his people from those Chaldeans. And this promise of deliverance and restoration is expressed throughout most of the chapter as the Lord promising to restore, to bring back, to save, return, heal, multiply, honor, and establish the people of Israel. We see those words used in verses 3, 7, uh, 9, 11, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Now, note that this deliverance and restoration does not overlook Israel's sins and iniquity, which are brought up in verses 14 and 15 as, of course, the reasons why God was judging Israel with devastation and exile. God's grace is given to them in spite of the way they acted, which is how his grace always operates. Now, the key to understand here is what's the timing of all of this? Obviously, it includes the restoration from Babylon, returning from Babylon, but is that all that's being referred to, or is this extending to a future event down the road? We know from Ezra and Nehemiah that the people of Judah do eventually return from Babylon. We know chapter 29's promise that the exile would last 70 years, along with that famous verse in chapter 29, verse 11, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares Yahweh, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope which is directed to Israel. But is that event, that return from Babylon, is that the entirety of what chapter 30 is referring to? Well, we have some clues. First, we see in verse 7 some pretty eschatological language, end times language. That day is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress, but he will be saved. Now, that type of language is most often reserved for speaking of the end times, often being stated as the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, when Israel's distress will be far worse than what has come before. All you have to do is look at the end of the book of Zechariah. You'll see that very clearly. Next, we see in verses 8 and 9 that it is on that day when the Lord will not only free Israel from oppression, but will then keep them from being slaves to any more strangers. Now, we know that this couldn't be referring to their freedom from Babylon because later on, Israel would be conquered by others, most notably Rome, who is over all of Israel by the time of the birth of Christ. Furthermore, their service, it says in verse 9, will be to Yahweh their God and David their king. That's clearly referring to the future reign of the Messiah, the descendant of David. There has not been a descendant of David on the throne of of Israel since this exile. Now, most of the rest of the chapter uh, does hold true for the return from exile that Judah experienced post-Babylon, but verse 32 again gives us a third piece of evidence. This is looking beyond that time to the end times. You shall be my people and I will be your God. Now, that's a statement that requires a nationwide conversion of the heart in order to be true. In fact, that's exactly what chapter 31 is going to get into. And the fourth and final piece of evidence in chapter 30 that this is referring to the future deliverance and restoration of the remnant of Israel during the end times of this age is the worldwide wrath that's exhibited in verses 23 and 24. All of the wicked of the earth will be affected. Yahweh is going to perform and accomplish all the intent of his heart, and this will occur in the latter days. And so the big principle that we need to gather from this is that God does have a future in store for Israel. Rather than discard Israel or think that it was somehow replaced by the church, we ought to look forward to that time at the end of this age when the Lord will regenerate the entire nation of Israel. Of course, that will be a remnant that will repent and believe in Christ because there's no other way to be saved. Romans 11, 1 through 5, Paul says, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I, too, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Lord, they've killed your prophets, they've torn down your altars, and I alone am left. They're seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In the same way, then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. 
May we pray for salvation in Israel, just as we should be praying for salvation across the globe. And may we seek to glorify God with our lives now, just as we look forward to Israel doing the same one day. This has been Jeremiah chapter 30, and I hope you have a great day.